Uh, thank you very much indeed, Laura, for the introduction. Uh, what I hope to do in the next 15 minutes is take you through some of the opportunities that exist from uh, the Earth, geoenergy itself. But let's start with some of the, uh, the basics, as it were. Where does our energy come from? Well, we have three sources. The sun, which provides light and heat. The earth, which provides heat and materials, uh, some of which we'll hear about from Andrew. And we get a little bit of help from the moon, of course, and uh, uh, gravity as it works together. There are a whole range of geoenergy opportunities, some of which, of course, have powered the planet for the past uh, two centuries or so in terms of fossil fuels. But what I'd like to concentrate on are three aspects. Geothermal energy as it stands, uh, a little nuance, a play with that, not yet in the uh, uh, operational phase of CO2 uh, geothermal energy, and then touch on what might be a new possibility for uh, finding natural hydrogen. Uh, and I'll leave Andrew to um, talk, uh, obviously, about the uh, materials in the final uh, session of this uh, final talk of this session. So in terms of geothermal energy, again, just think about uh, the Earth for a moment. Um, the heat of the Earth is sustainable. Uh, back um, a century or more ago, Lord Kelvin calculated the age of the Earth, and he got it wrong, spectacularly wrong, by about a factor of 10, suggesting that the Earth would have cooled from uh, the initial molten gravity segregated mass in about 400 million years. But it was uh, our own Arthur Holmes at Durham who, following the recognition of um, uh, radioactive, radioactive uh, decay, uh, reset the clock, and we now know the Earth to be four and a half billion years old. And that radioactive decay is heating the Earth. And I'm pleased to say that in four and a half billion years, we've only used about 15%. So as far as humanity is concerned, we're OK. Uh, the heat will continue. The heat itself is very good in terms of uh, both direct heating or it can be used for cooling and in some instances for power generation. And overall, it's excellent for base load. The another rather interesting thing about geothermal energy itself is that wherever you go on the Earth, this heat beneath your feet, it varies from Iceland to Durham, if you will, uh, but everyone has opportunity. In fact, there really is no opportunity to form a no, a, an OPEC of geothermal energy. Moreover, we don't require exotic materials uh, to uh, make best use of that geothermal energy. It has a small surface footprint as well. There are challenges. Uh, too much cold water, too deep in the ground can induce seismicity. And uh, the big problem compared with um, fossil fuels, for example, is that the energy density within geothermal energy is pretty low. Uh, you know, never is a barrel of hot water going to sell for the same as a barrel of oil. But nonetheless, in the right situation, we can use it extensively. Uh, some, a couple of years ago, uh, working with Charlotte, we tried to calculate uh, what the geothermal potential was uh, for the whole of the UK. Uh, and just before we do that, let's just recognize how much heat we use in the UK. 50% of all the energy used on an annual basis goes on heating. It's about 45% in Brighton and 55% in the Shetlands or so. And 77% of that heat comes from the burning of fossil fuels, mostly in our own homes. Uh, some in power stations, generating electricity, which we use, but as you see, 77% or so um, in, in total. And most of that turns out to be uh, natural gas, methane. And that results in a little over 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions of the UK. Um, and in order to tackle that huge emission spectrum from heat, we need to think of it differently. And having done the calculations, looking at where there is both heat demand and potential supply in the UK, supply we'll examine in a bit more detail in a moment, we concluded that at its most profligate, with no uh, return of the cooled water back into the earth, uh, we had about 100 years supply. And that 100 years or so is much, much greater than you can uh, come up with in terms of the, the ratio between uh, reserves and production, for example, for petroleum, or, or, even, or even coal. In the UK, 
Um, when I first arrived at Durham University, we were using about 50 million tons of coal a year and had about 50 million tons of reserves. In other words, if no imports, we'd have about one year's supply. So this is looking at very low, very low impact, low carbon uh, energy. And there is an absolute minimum of 100 years if we're profligate. We could do rather better than that. And the sort of uh, locations in which we can get uh, geothermal energy vary across the country. You'll hear uh, a substantive story from uh, both Charlotte and Steve on the opportunity for redeveloping coal mines, not as a source of coal or methane, but this time as a source of tepid water, tepid water, uh, which you can use uh, for uh, district heating and so on, perhaps with a little bit of upgrade, uh, tepid water, which happens because we built our coal, sorry, because we built our industrial centers and towns associated with the mining of coal in the regions where we have coal. There is a great co-location of the resource in terms of um, uh, mine water heat and uh, the usage. But we can go further than that. Uh, back in uh, 2010, I was part of a team led by uh, the late Paul Younger, which drilled for a second time into the Weirdale granite. The Weirdale granite sits beneath Weirdale, uh, first discovered by drilling done by Durham University back in 1961. And although that granite is 400 million years old or thereabouts, it's still warm. It's still warm, not because it's taken that long to simply cool down, but because it contains those same uh, radionuclides which are keeping the whole earth warm. And we know, for example, that Durham miners uh, in a number of the mineral veins which were worked across uh, the area uh, were bathed in, in really quite warm water coming out of the associated fractures and so on associated with the granite. And indeed, when the granite was first drilled, or, or rather dr first drilled this century in 2004, uh, by the first well in Eastgate, it flowed at uh, rates which were a world record uh, for flow of uh, water from granites uh, and included um, temperatures in the particular flow regime uh, around about 25 degrees centigrade or so from a fairly shallow well. Uh, interestingly as well, uh, the waters contained in this particular granite are rich in lithium, an element which could, of course, be used for um, uh, lithium batteries and so on. But it's not just granites and coal mines. All across the UK, we've built our cities predominantly on areas which have underlying sedimentary, deep sedimentary aquifers. In the Cheshire Basin, for example, uh, we know that the temperature down is about five kilometres in uh, sandstones that you can see outcropping in, in Stockport and, uh, and around the edge of the basin, temperatures of about 100 degrees centigrade. And those data have also been worked up in terms of uh, the opportunity set. So a huge uh, range of opportunities there. But we can also uh, help, the, the earth has an opportunity for helping uh, tidy up our act in terms of what we're doing with regard to having burnt fossil fuels during the current period and working our way from the industrial revolution because we can also capture the co2 uh, from things like power stations and concentrated supplies and perhaps even in future uh, from uh, the uh, uh, atmosphere itself and we can exploit our knowledge of the north sea and the east irish sea and associated areas uh, to use depleted oil and gas fields, or even deep saline non-potable aquifers for storage of what we call dense phase CO2. Uh, and CCS, as it's called, has taken a while to uh, get going in the UK. We've had a number of uh, failures from various governments over the past 15 years or so, but now we look set within the next few years to see active uh, development of a number of sites associated with hydrogen generation for industry or for homes, or um, power generation, whether it be in the East Irish Sea offshore Liverpool, where uh, there are plans to use the Hamilton field, an old depleted gas field, or further afield offshore Scotland, and uh, a whole array of opportunities in the uh, central and northern North Sea, and then down off the English East English coast as well. And you see in the bottom right-hand corner, the Endurance uh, CCS site, 
uh, first drilled by National Grid Carbon back in uh, 2013. That looks set to become one of the first to be developed as well. The opportunity is uh, in terms of that uh, runs to hundreds of, and perhaps even thousands, billions, hundreds of millions, perhaps even thousands of uh, 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 tons of carbon dioxide we can bury. Whoops, and I've gone past one. But there is an additional opportunity uh, and something I'm working on the, pre the present, it's certainly not developed. You can use CO2 as a power fluid within geothermal systems. We've looked at water for generating power in North Sea uh, fields, and you can see on the right hand side a graph uh, created by uh, a colleague, Alison Old, a couple of years ago, in which we can, in some fields, generate tens of uh, megawatts of power from the associated and unwanted uh, hot brine which flows from the wells. But I'll substitute the hot brine for CO2 and you do away with the parasitic load of putting water in the ground. The CO2 remains in a closed system and within the dense phase, but we can harvest heat from the subsurface. And we're currently working with ETH Zurich, Postam, uh, and Associates through to Shell and further afield, uh, Siemens as well, of course, to try and develop this system. <clears throat> and this would be the first commercialization on large industrial scale of waste CO2. So it's just possible we might be able to turn what were former oil and gas fields in the North Sea into new um, uh, geothermal sources. And let's look further into the future, but not too far. Um, hydrogen is rightly acknowledged to be the fuel of the future in terms of gas, and it's acquired a number of colors depending on how you manufacture it. Might we add a fourth color, naturally occurring hydrogen? And if we did, would it cost us more than manufacturing? Probably not. These are some figures put together by uh, KPMG a few years ago, to which I've added uh, this idea of gold natural hydrogen. The finding cost would be the same as methane, and therefore, potentially, because you're not then having to manufacture the hydrogen from the methane and, and store the CO2, potentially it could undercut those costs. And is natural hydrogen real or imaginary? This is a, a chart or a map produced by Zagonic in 2020. Hydrogen uh, is now being spotted across the world. This map simply reflects the amount of surveys, surveys which have gone on. In terms of concentrated hydrogen, yes, one field has been found by accident by, uh, in Mali. Uh, and we now have a program um, beginning to develop ways in which we can examine how hydrogen is formed, how it matures within the source rock, uh, what the primary migration out of the source rock is, how it accumulates, and most importantly, because hydrogen is such a reactive uh, species, how we preserve hydrogen such that it be, can be found on purpose rather than accidentally in the fields uh, such as the one in Mali. We now have funding uh, for a PhD, and we are just on the cusp of, of getting industrial uh, sponsorship for a, a postdoctoral research assistant. The idea of gold hydrogen seems to have caught uh, the markets, um, not by surprise, but with some significant interest. So uh, uh, from geothermal to perhaps natural hydrogen, we have an opportunity uh, to deliver ultra low carbon, uh, energy, heating, and possibly power, um, possibly gas too with the hydrogen uh, for the zero carbon future. Thank you very much indeed.